Hello and welcome once again to The Blueprints. This is Canada's Conservative Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Schmale, Member of Parliament for Halliburton, Fourth of Brock, with new content for you every single Tuesday, 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We ask that you like, subscribe, comment, share this program. Together, we can push back against that ever-moving liberal agenda. Great show for you lined up today. A lot happening in Ottawa. We're going to talk about the emergency sack. But before I do, remember, if you can't watch or listen to the entire program, download it later on. Listen to it on platforms like CastBox, iTunes, Google play spotify you name it it is out there so bringing back two individuals i know we're not in this studio uh, a lot going on so we weren't able to get into the brand new studio but doing over zoom we're bringing back two friends of the show we have uh blaine calkins the member of parliament for red deer lacombe he's also the uh, opposition whip and john broussard member of parliament for barry innisville also the house leader good afternoon gentlemen hey jim good to be here jamie well, let's talk about the Emergencies Act. I know there's a lot going on, a, a big vote yesterday. Uh, okay, who wants to kick it off? Uh, how did we get here? I, I, I can't believe we're even discussing this for the first time since the beginning of this legislation in the 80s. So I'll kick it off. Procedurally, the government announced on February 14th that they were going to invoke the Emergency Act. Uh, they had uh, several days to table that in Parliament, a motion to debate it. Uh, so they did an order in Council and they publicly released the regulations. Um, we started debate on it on Thursday. It lasted all weekend with the exception of Friday and it culminated in the vote last night. So, Blaine, do you think this could have been avoided? Do you think we really needed to get to this point? Well, no, I mean, the whole problem is that uh, Canada's Prime Minister doesn't understand the entirety of the Canadian population and has demonized, vilified, and politicized issues that he hadn't ought to have, especially at a time when everybody in Canada was struggling. Everybody was in their own way uh, fighting uh, through the COVID um, measures that uh, were put in place. Uh, but um, I, I think we're here now because the the leadership of the Prime Minister um, has failed Canadians, and he's politicized just prior to the last election the issue of vaccine mandates. Uh, pitting unvaccinated and vaccinated Canadians against each other. And uh, that's what has been uh, boiling and uh, infuriating Canadians with recent announcements that truckers who were once hailed as heroes uh, would be unable to continue on with their duties uh, if they needed to go across international borders. They've even threatened uh, to take away interprovincial travel for these uh, same workers. And uh, the government has, and the NDP, for that matter, have simply lost touch with the working class of Canada. And on Blaine's point, Jamie, if I can add to what we're really seeing is a manifestation of anger and anxiety right across the country. Canadians are fed up. A couple of weeks ago, we put a motion before Parliament to at least have the government come up with some sort of exit strategy. We're seeing other G7 countries announce, uh, we're seeing provinces and territories announce uh, ends to restrictions, mandates, uh, passports, and all of that stuff. And we put a motion before Parliament, every single Liberal, with the exception of one, including the NDP, voted against that. And it was a simple request to at least come up with a plan by February 28th. And we also saw that that Dr. Theresa Tam had said that we have to get back to some normalcy. So conservatives have tried to move the country forward. Uh, the prime minister continues with the Emergency Act to invoke what it is effectively a nuclear option uh, to keep the country under control. I do want to unpack that nuclear option uh, comment but before I get to that. Uh, just to talk about um, before this was even brought uh, brought forward, the, the, the government just seemed like they wanted to continue to use force rather than, than compromise. If you, if you think about it, as you just mentioned, a lot of countries were opening up, restrictions were being relaxed all across the globe, and then at a 90% vaccination rate, the truckers were going back and forth throughout the whole pandemic when there wasn't even a, a vaccine during the most deadly time of, of the virus. And, and there, there goes the vaccine mandate on, on, on the truckers. It just seemed just why bother at this point to do that measure? Of course, the United States uh, imposed similar measures, but there, there wasn't even a phone call to the president to say, you know what, I, th I think this has gone a bit too far. Well, if I can start, uh, and Blaine will certainly pick up on this, uh, to me, it's all about control. We've got a prime minister who just seemingly doesn't want to re you know, relent on any control of uh, any aspect of this pandemic. That's why, as I said earlier, we tried to move the country forward by uh, developing an exit plan. It was voted against by the Liberals. 
um, at a time when we're seeing provinces and territories announce similar measures of vaccine passports and mandates, um, and they're they're limiting them. They're they're actually ending them, and they've got specific dates uh, to do that. So, you know, it, it, it's a, it's also Jamie. The problem is it's not just the mandates on the truckers, but it's the language that the prime minister has been using, as I said, in this manifestation of these protests and the anxiety and the anger that people are feeling right across the country, not just here uh, in Ottawa. We saw obviously publicly in Ottawa, a big display of that, uh, that anger and anxiety, uh, but it's the language he's been using, calling Canadians racist, misogynist, extremist. Do we tolerate those people? I mean, this is not a prime minister uh, who is acting as a prime minister. He's uh, vilifying people who he doesn't agree with. That's not what a prime minister is supposed to do. A prime minister is supposed to be the prime minister of all people, whether you agree with their views or not. And we're seeing him act in a way. And, and really, when you think about how all of this anger started manifesting itself, it's when he appeared on that Quebec TV show, and it was widely publicized and broadcast, uh, referring to Canadians as misogynist, racist, extremist. Do we tolerate their views? Do we accept their views? That's when Canadians started saying, you know what, that, that's not what I am. And that's not who I am. And it, you know, what we've seen now is uh, almost a natural conclusion uh, of what um, the politi identity politics is all about, which the Prime Minister has been practicing for the last six years. We've seen it for six years. Canadians have only seen it in the last two years because they've been paying attention. And the, the, the debate, Jamie, has been very, very polarizing. Again, there hasn't been a lot of unity except uh, the Prime Minister's press conference at uh, 11 a.m. yesterday. Uh, did actually contain language that he was going to pretend to be the great unifier. He talked about the rights and freedoms of the citizens of Ottawa, uh, their right to, um, I guess, peace and quiet uh, supersedes the right of a truck driver in Canada to earn a living, uh, the right of a truck driver who is fired for not getting vaccinated to even access employment insurance to provide for his or her family. Uh, the Prime Minister a year ago in January of 2021, when asked about vaccine mandates and passports, actually his initial reaction was that he didn't think it was a good idea because it would trample on the rights and freedoms of Canadians. Well, somebody did the math for him prior to the last election and said, if we actually divide Canadians on this issue, uh, we should be able to win a majority government. That's the gamble that he took. It didn't work, it backfired on him. He is now embarrassed. And uh, these truckers who have come down here have embarrassed and humiliated him. Uh, which is why we're using the Emergencies Act. Look, the, the, the reality is I, all of us have been here in downtown Ottawa. Uh, we walk around, are people inconvenienced? Yes, um, some people are inconvenienced. Uh, that is absolutely true. But um, the, the biggest uh, charge that will be laid, in my opinion, on anybody down here in Ottawa uh, is mischief. And for that, uh, the government has invoked uh, the Emergency Measures Act, the former War Measures Act. This is a complete overreach of the government. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, yes, mischief and trespassing seem to be the most common charges. So did we really need to go here? There were powers in place already to compel tow truck drivers to assist police. There were already uh, laws in place that would have uh, dealt with the potential clearing of the blockades or even from the blockades from starting in, in the first place. Uh, the fact that the federal government is now involved in this something that is fairly isolated because the border's already been closed or cleared, I should say, uh, before the invoking of this act. Uh, like, this just seems like overkill to a situation that didn't need to, to have the Emergencies Act invoked. It, it could have been done with existing legislation. This is all about political theater, uh, Jamie. The prime minister uh, was looking weak and inept as, um, and, and rightly so, because his response and his ability to uh, govern Canada is weak and inept. Uh, so this is about saving his political fortunes. Every police officer in Canada has the ability to enforce the criminal code across the, all of Canada when they see a crime in progress. So these measures are not needed. I'm sure the police always would like to have more authority, but these measures were not needed. This is, like I said, a political solution to a political problem, uh, not a uh, legal issue to a legal problem that the police had. Well, effectively, it's a nuclear solution to a problem that you know, and Jamie, you were quite right when you talked about 
some of the legislative and regulatory powers that are already existing. Let's not forget that the city of Ottawa declared a state of emergency. The provincial government declared a state of emergency. Within those state of emergencies, uh, they give themselves uh, certain authorities and powers, not the least of which under the Police Act is to consolidate police if they choose to from all over the province, which is effectively what happened. They didn't need the Federal Emergency Act to do that. The transport minister has authority to um, uh, deal with blockades at borders uh, using extraordinary powers that they have. I know the Prime Minister yesterday in his press conference talked about the need to confiscate uh, tow trucks in order to move trucks. Well, that uh, certainly falls under uh, police powers as well, that they can confiscate vehicles in the performance of their duty in, in order to effectively remove the trucks that were available. So none of what the prime minister has indicated, despite his ability to stand in front of a bank of TV cameras and reporters and exasperate his opinion on things, none of this was required. Certainly, we weren't facing an issue of terrorism, at least we didn't see any evidence of that. Uh, we weren't facing a situation where where you know the state of our democracy was at risk, uh, you know, and the charges I think reflect, as you indicated, uh, charges of mischief or Blaine indicated charges of mischief and trespassing certainly uh, are not enough to constitute or qualify the invocation of an Emergency Measures Act, which is the equivalent of a War Measures Act. If we recall during the FLQ crisis, I mean, I was a young child at the time, but you know, we all learned this through history. We had ministers of the crown that were being kidnapped and murdered. We had bombs going off. We had uh, you know, other things, significant things that were happening uh, in the province of Quebec. I've gone around Ottawa, not one window of any shop has been broken, not one door has been broken. And yet this was the political, uh, solution that the Prime Minister used uh, to make himself, as Blaine said, look a little more powerful because of his weak and inept uh, response to, uh, to this, cri that this, this issue. I wouldn't even call it a crisis, um, but it was just, it was the wrong thing to do at the wrong time. And uh, I know he's going to take a lot of credit for it, but it wasn't needed because of the other legislative, regulatory and statutes that are available to all levels of government, not the least of which are the provincial government. All right. And before I get to kind of what's next, I do want to talk about something we, we kind of haven't touched on yet is the freezing of bank accounts for those that oh. may or uh, may have donated to the cause or have, I believe I've seen reports of being purchased. I believe at this, uh, according to this one news site, 70 accounts have been frozen so far worth about 3.22 million. It, I think this sets a dangerous precedent because not only does it show that the government can can come in and seize your accounts if it uh, disagrees with something you you believe in, but also for the greater investment community. Uh, Canada is, is always, or at least I believe, hopefully is still known as a safe place to put uh, your money and invest, but I, I, I'm just worried about the precedent this sets. Well, the uh, it, certainly everyone should be concerned because you know the government is using the guise of the protests as a means to uh, seize or freeze the bank accounts uh, of Canadians. The finance minister in her press conference on last Friday had indicated that they were going to move to make these measures more permanent, not within the scope of the Emergency Act, but actually uh, I suspect that means that they would introduce legislation that if you know, there's any political dissent at all, and you contribute to that uh, financially, that somehow the government or, you know, its authorities would, would freeze your bank account for donating to a political cause. And, uh, you know, that should be extremely troubling to concert to, uh, to Canadians and, and to political parties like conservatives, if the government does, if, if you don't agree with the government, you know, are they going to are they going to freeze your bank account because you donate to a political party, whether it's a, a separatist party, like, for example, the, the Bloc Québécois or or anything else like this is a very, very dangerous slope that the government is taking us down. And again, it speaks to, you know, the diminishment of our democratic institutions and the trust that people need to have, not just in uh, our parliamentary institutions, but our banking institutions and law enforcement as well. It's, it's very troubling to hear what the government is intending through this, especially if they're already musing about making this more permanent. 
It's one thing, Jamie, to clear the streets. It's another thing to clear Canadians' bank accounts. This is very, very problematic because underpinning every right and freedom that we exercise as Canadian usually lies a financial transaction. So whether we're uh, buying something uh, to go to a protest, whether we're uh, buying something or paying for something to exercise our freedom of speech, such as paying for a cell phone or our internet service, uh, whether we're uh, donating to our places of worship or anything uh, like that, uh, we're exercising our fundamental freedoms and they all require a transaction. And it is actually very Orwellian uh, that um, the government would be using their powers unfettered and not actually cross-examined in front of a judge through a bank account, likely from Intel, from hacked uh, uh, data from, um, from these, for these transactions is something that I think all Canadians should be alarmed about. Yeah, especially when you see Fintrack saying there is no evidence of increased extremist donations and you see, and even in the text, uh, the references to information provided by the CBC as to why they're invoking this. There wasn't actually a, a massive uh, uh, you know, a threat to our, our nation at that point. We do have to wrap up very soon, but I do want to talk about what's next. What are we going to do as the opposition? We have the whip and house leader here for the opposition. What what are we going to do to help those who, who are feeling, you know what, I'm done with these mandates or... The government's gone too far. What is happening? Why don't you two lay this out? I, I, I don't know who to start with here. So I see uh, John's got his hand up. We'll start with John. Yeah, I'm not. I'm, I'm certainly not going to get into some of the procedural um, and rules based uh, op options that we have, Jamie. I'm just not going to get into that today. Uh, but one thing you can be assured of and Canadians can be assured of all Canadians, whether you're a conservative supporter or not. And this this issue has touched everyone. I mean, you know, like you and like Blaine and like many of our colleagues, I have literally received thousands of emails over the weekend since the invocation of the act and uh, since the debate started. And I, I kicked it off on Thursday by saying that the eyes of the nation are upon us and they certainly are on this issue, but we're going to keep fighting. Uh, uh, to ensure that the rights and freedoms of Canadians are maintained, that our democratic institutions are held in place and that the foundations of those institutions are solid. And you can bet that Canada's Conservatives under Candace Bergen will continue to fight on your behalf. Uh, not yours, Jamie, not Blaine, although indirectly we will, but on behalf of all Canadians uh, to uh, ensure that this massive, expansive overreach, this nuclear option that the government imposed on this country uh, is, uh, is taken back as quickly as possible. Couldn't agree more, John, and it's a pleasure to work uh, alongside you uh, as we are united as a Conservative caucus down here in the fight uh, against Justin Trudeau and his irresponsible method of governance, his, um, his demeanor to divide, wedge, and uh, scapegoat, and to vilify those Canadians that he disagrees with. Uh, it's clear that when the Prime Minister of the country starts calling his own citizens' names, uh, that we would end up uh, where we are today. But we're going to continue to fight against the vaccine mandates. Uh, and we're going to obviously continue to hold the government to account to ensure that this government has the power, has no, doesn't have the power that it has seized using this uh, emergency order uh, any longer than absolutely necessary. We don't think they need it at all, but we will continue to uh, use every procedural tactic that we have that the law allows for, that the House rules allow for to ensure that this government is held to account. Excellent. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Really appreciate you coming on the show once again and uh, explaining the process, talking about what the opposition has been doing. I think it's very important because uh, you don't always get the, the this point of view from, from the mainstream media. So I, I do appreciate your time, gentlemen. You don't? <laughs> and, and we got hard through to, hard to believe and we got through a whole episode without Broussard telling us he used to be a firefighter so that, that in itself is, how do you know you're sitting next to a fireman how just wait a minute he'll tell you <laughs> <laughs> thank all you right. Right. John Broussard member of parliament very all right. Phil also the uh, opposition house leader and uh, Blaine Calkins member of parliament Red Deer Lacombe in the beautiful province of Ontario so the opposition whip we appreciate the time we have lots more questions but we'll do it again in a different show remember new content every single Tuesday 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We do appreciate you viewing. viewing. We also ask that you like, comment, subscribe, share this program. Together we can push back against the ever-moving liberal agenda. If you can't watch it all now, download it, listen to it. Platforms like CastBox, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and tell your friends. As always, remember, low taxes, less government, more freedom. That is the blueprint.